Metro is a series that is held in high regard by many people. Being popular in Eastern Europe since the first iteration of the book was published online in 2002, to garnering a cult following here in the West due to the popularity of the games. Set in the not-too-distant future, when nuclear war has wiped out most of humanity, and the few who survived scrape out a meagre existence in Moscow's metro tunnels. With stations becoming little cities and the surface an inhospitable environment, with monsters overtaking the old buildings and city streets. That's a brief explanation of the setting, but I imagine most people watching will have some experience with the franchise. Anyway, what we're going to be doing in this video is taking a look at the original novel trilogy by Dmitry Glukovsky and comparing them to the Redux versions of Metro 2033, Last Light, and the new Metro Exodus to see how the series holds up. As such, there will be a few spoilers, though I'll try to keep it to a minimum, particularly with Exodus, since I know many people are waiting for the Steam release to play it. Now, I didn't play the release version of Metro 2033, and from what I gather, that wasn't necessarily a bad thing due to more than a few bugs and the fact that the original version of the game hasn't aged too well. The graphics and gameplay are decent enough in the Redux version, if you can tolerate exposition being fed to you by various characters you're obliged to follow. There's also a few weak chapters that you probably don't remember as fondly as some others, but the atmosphere is where the metro shines. Oh, and the guns. The gun customization is really good. The Bi Gun, the Helsing, and the Bastard Gun are some of my favourites, but they've got some crazy fucking guns in this game. Also, the Ranger mode is really fun. At first, I wasn't too much of a fan, since I didn't like the idea of hamstringing myself with a two-gun limit and no heads-up display. But on your second or third playthrough, once you know the mechanics a bit, this really adds to the immersion factor. Having to remember how many bullets you have, count your shots, and generally play it a lot safer. It makes for a really entertaining way to play through the game. Plus, you get the AKSU, which has a high rate of fire and is quite fun to use, but if you're playing on Ranger mode, you'll probably replace it, since it absolutely inhales bullets compared to some of the other guns. Anyway, like I said, the atmosphere of Metro 2033 is absolutely stunning. The minute details about the stations, with people going about their day, vendors yelling about how good their prices are, this is in contrast with the dark and desolate tunnels, where all matter of mutants and monsters can jump on you at any second. You'll be running low on ammo, scrimping by, when all of a sudden a horde of Nassalazes converge on you at once. But then just as you're reaching the reprieve of a station, you find that it's been overrun, and that constant feeling of ominous dread is present throughout most of the game, your only relief coming from reaching the safety of one of the more secure metro stations. But even then, once you've stocked up, unless you've played the game before, you'll have no idea when the next chance to do so is. But the question remains, is it a good translation of the book? The book is good. Really good. Eastern Europeans certainly know how to do speculative fiction well, and the fact that Artyom isn't anything special, unlike many Western protagonists, makes him that much more relatable. He's just an ordinary guy that's thrust into an extraordinary situation when Hunter gives him the task of delivering his message to Polis. But at the same time, Artyom feels a deep-seated responsibility regarding his mission since ultimately he was the one that opened the hermetic door to the botanical gardens when he was a child, laying the foundation for the Dark Ones to seek out Exhibition Station in the first place. What follows is a classic coming-of-age tale, with a bittersweet ending that the game kind of downplayed by splitting it into a good and bad ending. Personally, I don't think the game does the book justice. In the game you encounter Nazis, Communists, and the Rangers of Polis, but you never really get a chance to learn that much about those factions, unless you're eavesdropping on every campfire conversation you come across or finding the hidden journals in the levels. In the book, however, Artyom meets much more factions, uh, cult of Jehovah's Witnesses, Satanists that are trying to dig through the metro into hell, a sect of cannibal children that worship a giant worm god, and much more. Artyom also learns much more about these factions through the characters he meets along the way. And it's through these interactions that the reader comes to realize that the world of metro isn't inherently good or evil. Those concepts were vaporized when the bombs dropped. Now it's just people trying to survive and forward their own ideologies. Also in the book, Archim only ever kills one person, and that becomes a very powerful moment for defining his character. Though a first-person shooter where you only kill one person wouldn't be very fun at all. One of the best chapters in the book is the one set in the Lenin Library. Now in the game, librarians are scary enough, but lose a lot of their fear factor once you know how to avoid them. Okay, if a beast gets nervous, move away, but slowly, and if you shoot, well, look or don't look, you won't see anything ever again. In the book, however, the librarians are much more scary. Now, I won't spoil it here, 
but those that have read the book will know exactly what I mean. But that's the thing about transitioning from one medium to another. A game based on a book might work so much better than, say, a game based on a movie, or a movie based on a game, not so much the other way around. Just, just as an aside, does anyone remember the pulpy book adaptations of the Assassin's Creed games? Yeah, you might remember they exist, but that's probably about it. But the thing is, while the book had a tense atmosphere, and more character and personality from Archim, who in the game is a largely silent protagonist, the book never made me jump out of my seat. Where a novel is only limited by your imagination and the writing skills of the author, a game that puts you into the shoes of a character has the potential to be a much more personal experience. The dark metro tunnels where you can't see far without a flashlight. The tense surface where you're running out of filters and each second up there is precious time. The howl of a watchman alerting a horde. The sound design, graphics, lighting and level layout all come together to create a believable world, where you feel concern for Archim at the least, and maybe even the people you meet along the way. Everyone that has read Metro 2033 has experienced the book in almost the exact same way. However, no two people will experience a game quite the same. Maybe you're lapping up all the details within the world of Metro 2033. Maybe you're focusing on getting the best guns. Whatever you're doing will be almost totally unique to you. And that's one thing that makes games special as a medium for storytelling. And that brings me to my next point. It's quite difficult to condense an entire novel's worth of story into an eight or so hour long campaign for a game, but if you have the author of that novel offer to write the story for your game and assist in producing it, then you have the potential for some very compelling storytelling indeed. Metro Last Light, rather than being an adaptation of Metro 2034, Last Light is a direct sequel to the events of Metro 2033, taking place after the bad ending. Now, Dmitry Glukovsky offered to assist in writing the story for this game, and it's a much more polished product than the first game. The pacing is much better, there are more guns to use, you find out more about the various factions than in 2033, there's also more side activities in the stations. You can get a strip tease, shoot rats, and even see a show at the theatre station. The characters are much better too, with a few familiar faces making a return in this game, as well as some new faces too. The only character that didn't really work was Anna, who is the love interest, though you barely interact with her during the campaign. And looking at my ass, it's way out of your reach, rabbit. That's me. Pavel, on the other hand, is one of the best written characters in almost any game I've played, which was why I was so pleased to see, or rather hear, that they brought back his English voice actor to do Crest in Metro Exodus. Last Light tells a redemption story, with Archim trying to atone for what he did to the Dark Ones in 2033, visiting various news stations and finding more about the ugly and paranormal sides of the Metro. Ultimately, no matter which ending you get, Artyom finds his redemption, though not without sacrifice, and this time it's the good ending that is regarded as canon. There's also a bunch of DLC chapters, with most of them being more of the same, but from the perspective of different characters during the events in the campaign, and a few maps to show off the combat and the 3D models. Though there is one set in the Lennon Library, where you play as a stalker and you go searching for various scrap and artifacts to take back and sell in order to buy more supplies or better equipment. It's very tense and enjoyable, though a little short, and it's nice to have a bit of a change of pace with this more open world type deal, rather than the extremely linear campaigns of 2033 and Last Light. And I have a feeling that this more open world type level was a precursor to the kind of game that Metro Exodus is. It's easy to see why they didn't adapt this book into a game, since instead of following one protagonist, Metro 2034 jumps between three during the course of the novel, and instead of Archim finding a way to defeat the Dark Ones, there's a plague at Tulskaya Station, and Hunter, who went missing at the start of Metro 2033, makes a return to try and stop it, meeting Homer, who is trying to write a novel on the history of the Metro. Through the course of the book, they try and find a way to cure the plague, before Hunter can get to Tulskaya Station and purge everyone there. This one is probably the weakest out of all the books, but it introduces several important characters for Metro 2035, such as Homer and Sasha, and it also serves as a way of introducing the reader to a little bit more about the Metro, particularly the more paranormal elements. Okay, so we're now entering mild spoiler territory for the more recent Metro 2035 and Metro Exodus, so if you don't want to have those spoiled for you, stop watching immediately. And if you are watching up to this point, thank you.
Metro 2035, the final chapter in Artyom's story, harkens back to when Artyom was on top of the Ostankino Tower, preparing to help guide the missiles to the Botanical Gardens. While he was up there, he received a radio signal from someone outside of Moscow, and has been trying to pick up another ever since. What follows is a massive journey going through a lot of Metro's existing factions and finding out how they've changed since the events of Metro 2033. While Artyom tries to get to Theatre Station to find a radio operator, who claimed to have also picked up a signal from outside of Moscow. Along the way, he finds out that the entirety of the Metro, the various infighting of the factions, the deliberate shortage of food, is being orchestrated by a secret organization that even Hansa and the Polis Rangers answer to. And it's them that is responsible for blocking radio signals to and from the Metro. Artyom tries to make this known throughout the Metro, but Ultimately, he comes to realize that no one really cares. They're all merely just trying to survive, doing exactly what the Metro was orchestrated to do. And so, he leaves the Metro for the final time in order to find somewhere else. I've glossed over a lot of the details here because 2035 is probably the longest book in the series. However, there is no shortage of tension, subversion, interesting characters and horror, and it's a great ending to Artyom's story. This concludes the book trilogy. While at times the writing can be a little confusing, especially when Glukovsky is depicting one of Artyom's visions or during certain character dialogues, though this may have something to do with the fact that the book's translated from Russian to English. But through the atmosphere, the factions, the characters, and the description of some of the stations and the surface, serve to create a very unique and interesting series of novels. It's tense at times, emotional at others, and a downright terrifying page-turner in some chapters that, if you're a fan of the games or just speculative fiction in general, you should definitely read. While I wouldn't say it's a masterwork of fiction, it's a damn fine trilogy of young adult novels that almost any young bloke will likely enjoy. When you boot up Exodus, it says that it's based on Metro 2035. This is kind of true. It essentially takes the premise from the novel that the Metro is being cordoned off from the rest of the world via a radio jammer. Then that's where Exodus begins to diverge from 2035, which is fair enough. Much like Metro 2034, it would be very difficult to translate the story into a game. Metro Exodus follows the story of Archim as he, Anna, now his wife and a much more well-written character in this game, Colonel Miller and a band of Spartan Rangers head out of the Metro to try and find a new place to settle, only to find out that the world isn't as dead as previously thought. Exodus takes place across several seasons and locations and is quite a different game to its predecessors. Instead of being a linear experience, Exodus puts you into a near open world where you have a main goal as well as several things to do on the side and you're free to go about these as you see fit. You're also rewarded for exploration as a new gun attachment or armor mod might be in any building you come across. Though there are times where you'll be in a more traditional, linear level, akin to the original Metro games. Overall, like how Last Light was an improvement on 2033, Exodus is an improvement on the previous games. The gun customization is insane now, being able to tailor and customize a gun however you'd like, and even swap out attachments on the fly. The moral system, instead of being a brief flash on the screen that might net you the good or bad ending, depending if you get enough points, instead it's reflected through the course of the game, as you might lose people along the way, and the morale of the people aboard the Aurora will be affected by this. Towards the climax of the game, you'll encounter some new enemy types that are genuinely terrifying. They're essentially Metro Exodus's take on the librarians, but you don't get explicitly told how to deal with them, and as such, you never really figure out how to abuse their AI in order to breeze through the level like you could do in 2033. But once you've made it through Novosibirsk, you've reached the end of the game, and it wouldn't be a Metro game if you didn't have a good or bad ending depending on how you've played the game. The endings are really heartfelt, both the good and the bad ones are a great conclusion to the franchise, and if you want to go back and get the other ending, you have the option of doing it all over again in New Game Plus, where you keep all your guns and equipment that you found on your first playthrough. The game is not without its issues though. There are a few bugs and glitches here and there, but it wasn't as bad as the Redux versions of Last Light in 2033. Exodus is also prone to almost immediately crashing if you tap out of the game at all. Also, the fact that you're free to do whatever activities you'd like in the open sections of the game means that there are some pacing issues compared to Last Light in 2033. 
but that's a trade-off for opening up the world and granting the player more freedom, rather than putting them on rails for the experience. So now that the game has been out for a while, the first of two DLC chapters have been released, with the other set to come out sometime in 2020. Anyways, this is a relatively short chapter that can be completed in about three or four hours, but pretty much every minute of it is thoroughly enjoyable. Set in Nervous Ibisk, you play as Colonel Klepnikov during the events that Artyom and Colonel Miller find out about whilst they're exploring Nervous Ibisk. It's very much a throwback to the original Metro games, with the beginning and last part of the mission being quite similar to 2033's survival horror chapters, and when the station is invaded by rebels, it's a lot like the final battle in Last Light. You also get a pretty sweet flamethrower to play with. While it is quite fun, and if you enjoyed Exodus you'd likely enjoy this new chapter, it's quite short, and you don't get to take the flamethrower into the main game via New Game Plus. You also don't get to play as Miller, but the Two Colonels does tell a compelling story about the similarities between the metros in Novosibirsk and Moscow, and will also help tide you over until the second DLC drops in 2020. In conclusion, Metro as a series has come quite a long way since its inception. From an obscure Russian novel put online in 2002 due to Dmitry Glukovsky being unable to find a publisher, through to garnering a cult following due to the success of the original games, with copies of the book being translated into pretty much every language spoken throughout Europe, into a massive game franchise with millions of copies of the games being sold all over the world. Through a massive collaborative effort on the part of some extremely talented people in the games industry, it's no doubt as to why Metro has such a passionate following, with Exodus being able to compete on the same level as some of the AAA games released this year. If you're a fan of the books, Dmitry Glukovsky also has a graphic novel set in the Metro universe called The Outpost. There's also dozens of different books by many different authors that Dmitry Glukovsky has endorsed as canon, so you're probably never going to run out of reading material if you're looking for more Metro. Thanks for watching. standing around, time to go. Huh. Radiation levels are rising. Better get your gas mask on. to get back to your station. Good hunting at this door. I'll see you in the middle, comrade. No matter how often we wish you would not. But our show for today is over. I hope you've enjoyed it as much as we have enjoyed your company. Thank you, and please come again.